are you doing, man? Are we gonna watch a movie or what? Yeah, sure. Prometheus. Yeah, you know the movie you wouldn't shut up about that you said we had to watch today because it's so great? Dude, I got stuff to do, man. Are you almost done or what? God, dude, what is your deal, bro? We talked about this, okay? I have to perform this ritual before we watch Prometheus. It's very important. Hey, 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 all right, all right. You know, that's all you had to say. Movie ritual, I got it. Just, shh, I'll, I'll be right here, quiet. I swear. Good. Because I'm almost ready to meet your maker. What? You know what, man? I'm, I'm just gonna go wait in the car, so have fun. Prometheus was written by John Spates and Damon Lindelof, based on elements by Dan O'Bannon and Ronald Shusett. And if those last two sound familiar, that's because that's right. This film, spoiler alert, is a prequel to Alien, although not directly. It's uh, more so set in the same universe before the events of Alien, but it is a prequel nonetheless. And it was of course directed by the Alien Man himself, Ridley Scott, and it was released in 2012. And immediately caused confusion on how it was connected to Alien, because it wasn't explicitly advertised that way. I don't know why people bitched about that because I absolutely love that that approach was taken with this film. It was expanding the lore of the Alien franchise while still standing on its own as its own film. Which, if you didn't tell someone that and they'd never seen any Alien movie, they, I mean, I guess that wouldn't matter. Okay, if they had seen Alien and they saw that movie, maybe they wouldn't have made the connection, at least not right away. And before I get into the synopsis of the plot for those who haven't seen it or need a refresher, I just want to say that Prometheus is a film that is massively misunderstood on its deeper level and potential, while also having some of the most disappointing and flawed writing and characters as shown on screen, ever put in a high concept and caliber film. It's one of the most bittersweet films that I know of, and I love it anyway. So to summarize the plot, following clues to the origin of mankind, a team finds a structure on a distant moon, but they soon realize they are not alone. Hmm. Now that's not very good, but it's on IMDb, so it must be official. <gasps> no. All right, let's turn to the master summarizer of IMDb, Nick Reganis. The way this guy writes summaries is epic. If you've watched my previous video, you know that I also pulled his summary of Alien because it's just nobody writes a summary like this guy, at least not that I've read. He's like the narrator of the next episode of Dragon Ball Z. Next time on Dragon Ball Z, Gohan's muscles erupt with his newly bridled power. All right, this is honestly gonna be difficult, but I'm gonna try to read it just like Nick would read it. All right, here we go. Following a faint trail of clues, the accomplished archeologist, Dr. Elizabeth Shaw, and her partner, Charlie Holloway, along with the 17-man crew embark on an ambitious deep space scientific expedition aboard the revolutionary space exploration starship, the USCSS Prometheus. The team sets foot on the rocky terrain of the desolate exomoon LV-223 in 2093 to investigate the existence of the superior extraterrestrial species known as the Engineers. But there, inside, a mysterious complex structure of cavernous dark chambers and an intricate underground system of tunnels. More enigmas await. Now, a terrifying discovery threatens not only the outcome of the bold outer space mission, but also the very future of humankind. Is the world prepared for the answers to the fundamental questions of human existence? Wow. I wish. 
I could have wrote that because that was epic. I told you, Nick's the man. So, Ridley Scott returning to sci-fi with Prometheus. Let alone a film connected to a sci-fi masterwork, Alien, was beyond epic. And he did a lot right with it, but sadly, it was also plagued with some terribly presented characters. But, on a more positive and spiritual note, Prometheus is a movie I saw and just felt it. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but if you know, you know. Now, I guess what I'm trying to say is I loved it. I try to keep my pure opinion out of these videos, but I can't help myself in saying I absolutely love this movie. I love what Ridley and his crew were trying to do with this. The whole concept of engineers who made us, who happen to be these porcelain-like Greek statue gods who are calling to us. Now, I'm not saying it's perfect, far from it, but so much was done right in this movie that doesn't get acknowledged. And even worse, the continuation of it was ruined by toxic fandom and a terrible movie called Alien Covenant. You've all sacrificed so much to be here and be a part of this thing we're doing. <laughs> no! No what? <laughs> no! God, please, no! 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 Now, Covenant is a very well-made film, but the way they took the story and the characters are terrible. If you think the characters of Prometheus are bad, go watch Covenant. Prometheus is a perfect example of loving a movie despite its flaws. Those flaws become just a disappointment that sits in your stomach instead of turning to dislike for the movie, which really is bittersweet because I love the concept and the movie, but it just, it could have been a lot better, especially from Ridley Scott, who is a legend. And many of the actors in the film, obviously, are also very good at what they do. I honestly feel the same way about Covenant because I love Prometheus and the whole franchise, so even though I can confidently say that I hate Covenant, I still sort of like it because it's still part of the franchise and it continues Prometheus, however disappointingly so. And Quentin Tarantino actually summed up one of the main issues of the film quite well, which I will heavily elaborate on myself, but let's watch what he had to say about it. Yeah, I saw Prometheus. When it came, we I had... loved that movie. Yeah. Wait, it was a, I, I loved it and I was disappointed oh, at the same oh, time. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Is this our first fight, baby? Yeah. What's going on? <laughs> well, it was, you know, I, I, on one hand, I was a little disappointed on, uh, about it. On the other hand, it was actually kind of cool to see such a big deal, serious science fiction epic by yeah, like, yeah. a director like Ridley Scott. Right. But there was part of it I actually did like, and I, uh, overall the experience was really cool having been in it. There was also a lot of dumb stuff in it, though. <laughs> yeah, but you know, you can't really have a science fiction movie without dumb stuff, or else it's not science fiction. You've got to, I mean, yeah, for every, for every, you know, Obi Wan, you've got to have your uh oh, Jar Jar yeah, somewhere. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. But I mean, when it got to the point where they're on a they're on another planet, and then a space cobra yeah. literally shows up, yeah. opens up its hood, yeah. and the guy who's in charge of alien creatures goes, hey, little fella, <laughs> how you doing? Yeah, 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 I, I like that. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, little man. fella, <laughs> it's a space cobra. What? So the two true heroes of the film, the capital offenders of the terrible character choices, are Fifield, played by Sean Harris, who's actually a good actor. And Milburn. Good old Milburn, gotta love him. Played by Raph Spall, who generally is annoying in everything I've seen him in. Look, I've got this whole thing at the moment about the difference between uh, cats and dogs. I have a- Please stop. Spearheaded by this film. So these guys play the worst people at their jobs ever, and uh, <laughs> they're just generally retarded. I'm, I'm gonna use that word multiple times because it's a great word, and I don't even mean the negative connotation with it, so take that how you will, but I'm simply summing up the idiocy of these characters when I say they are fucking retarded. Now, just to show you what I mean, here's the prime scene showcasing their brilliance as scientists. Is that tobacco? Is that tobacco in your respirator? Yeah, sure. 
Stalker. I don't know. Kind of looks like. What's that? Oh, oh, oh my God. Okay. Okay. Just Tell stay me. calm. Stay quiet. What this is, is okay. I can handle this. Hey, baby. Hey. Uh, come in, Prometheus. Elongate reptile type creature, maybe maybe 30, 40 inches, with transparent skin. It's beautiful. Okay. <laughs> Prometheus, we have two. Look at you. Look at you, baby. Jesus, look know. at the size of that. What is it? Look at you need to stay calm, okay? We'll set to be calm about. You need to stay calm, please. She is beautiful. She. What the hell makes you think that's female? Yeah, she's a lady. Look. Hmm? Oh. She's mesmerized. Come here. Come here. Okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Hey, baby. Oh, oh. Uh, uh, you're strong. Maybe you should help me now, okay? Yeah. Get it off, man, okay? Oh. 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 Come here, man, for God's sake! Oh, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. It's getting tighter. I ain't touching it. I don't want to touch it. That's the thing, man. For God's sake, don't be... Ah, God, you're making it worse. Ah, it's tightening. Oh, it's tight. Ah, ah, it's breaking my arm. It's breaking my arm. Ah! Cut it off. 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 <laughs> And you know, they're just great guys. They make a great pair. I think, you know, they're gonna be again bring a lot of sort of comedy element to the film. And also just the dynamic between them is very organic and uh, and very loose. And that's the great thing about Ridley, you know. <laughs> Insane, I know. Yeah, man, we're in the alien film. <laughs> you know I mean, this is Ridley. What's the matter with you, boy? You too stu stupid to do what your coach tells you? <laughs> now, on a serious note, I think one way that that same outcome of that scene could have played out, but in a non-retarded way, that would have salvaged it a little bit, could have been written like they were just, I don't know, passing time in that room, and Fifield notices the movement, just like he did, but instead of Milburn acting like a weird, idiot biologist who has a weird fetish for space worms uh you know they could have just say backed up away from the space worm snake thing and you know another one pops up and slithers up milburn from behind without him seeing it easily could have happened there was two in there where did the other one go that way you remove him acting like a moron and the same thing happens simple fix so doing something like that you know would have been a simple fix it would have treated the characters Maybe not intelligently, but at least not like retards. And you know, there's, there's kind of a theme with these characters when you contrast it to the engineers and David being an android, of uh, humankind being arrogant, which I'll get into a little more detail later. You could still have that theme with this, but you could still treat them with intelligence instead of retardedness. What are you doing? Charlie, don't be an idiot. Hey, don't be a skeptic. That would actually make the horror even worse because you would see that these highly adept and intelligent people are being steamrolled by this new environment as if to say our intelligence, however high, not in this film of course, matters not compared to what's in the universe because Prometheus is a high concept film with tons of effort poured into it. What concept is higher for humanity? The discovery of not only not being alone, but having a definitive Creator. Congratulations on me and your maker. Thank you. That is why those missteps of the film stand out so much because you have such an intelligent idea with just retards in the film who are supposed to be smart. It really not a good look for this movie. Look, I'm just a geologist. I like rocks. I love rocks. I think Fifield and Milburn are literally the worst people ever to hold jobs uh, and titles and degrees or whatever they had because they literally get lost with access to a map that Fifield made and in the film, which I'll show you, he literally says, 
I don't know. It all looks the same to me. In a building made of rock. Isn't this guy a geologist? It all, it all looks the same to me. Really? That's like someone... Milburn, biologist. That's like saying all fucking snakes look the same. Like, what? We've been here before if I failed. I don't know. It all looks the same to me. Now you could argue, like I mentioned, in a philosophical way that the way some of the characters act is to show the flaws, arrogance, and inferiority of humans. I ain't here to be your friend. I'm here to make money. Like a reason to understand why the engineers might have wanted to end humanity, but really, whether intentional or not, it failed. It's not satisfying to see supposed scientists good enough to be on a trip like this act so dumb. It's out of character enough to see that it was evident that it really was done just to move the plot along, which is never good character motivation. That is the most disappointing part of the film. No, I'm, uh, I'm out of here. You know, there's something I'm really excited about to share with you all because I actually found the only known footage of Ridley Scott talking about the Fifield Milburn scene with the development team at the studio. And it truly explains just how this could have happened in a Ridley Scott movie. So I hope you enjoy it because I had to work really hard to track it down and you know, I might get sued by Ridley Scott because they clearly didn't want it to get out but we deserve to see it so let's watch it. So the scene basically consists of Fifield analyzing the room since he's a geologist and he gets some samples of the room and he understands that the engineers were very smart basically and uh, suddenly a space worm comes up from the liquid, the Black Goo River and you know Milburn <sighs> since he's the, the, the biologist you know Ridley? He, he knows to be still very doing careful, here, man? since he does not know <sighs> what this species is. It's the first time mankind has encountered it. And of course we know it's worms that have been okay, really? by the black. I'm gonna stop you right there, because we ain't doing that. <laughs> we ain't doing all that science bullshit, okay? Nobody cares about that. That ain't cool. We want cool. I'm sorry, you, you do know that this is a science fiction movie, you know, science being the main key word there. This is a team of scientists. The best in their field, in fact. That's why they were chosen for this mission to go to this planet to meet our creators. We gotta make one of those guys smoke weed. <laughs> oh my god, bro. He's got a bong built into a suit. Huh? Ridley? Come on, you like that one. Here's what's gonna happen. They're gonna be in that room after the tattooed head guy smokes weed. Okay, the other guy's gonna be in love with that space worm thing you said. And He's gonna treat it like a puppy dog that he wants to fuck, okay? He's gonna have this weird thing where he's calling it baby and how saying that it's beautiful and stuff. People are gonna love that, man. They're gonna love that. And that's, that ain't really cool. That's more just, you kinda wanna see that guy die. So it's, it's satisfying, okay? And then the worm is gonna like wrap around him and break his arm. He's gonna cry like a little bitch. And then it's gonna, he's gonna suck it. He's gonna suck it off. Oh, Christ. Why would they do, the guy is a biologist, okay? The snake goes, that's a telltale sign. Even, I don't, you have to be a biologist to understand that. It's gonna attack him. Why is he still doing that? You know what, you win, Frank. I have 50 films lined up for the next 15 years. I don't have time to argue this, all right? I literally have to move on, okay? So you win, really, you get your, really, your special ed kids and really, that love weed. Really, Congratulations. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's the guy I love, man. Give me five, yes. Wow. You know, I didn't realize that Ridley Scott sounded like that. His, his accent really flows, you know, between all the different areas of the UK. It's. That's weird. Maybe that's just behind closed doors or like when he's really passionate about a film, he just a little flowy in his accent. I didn't know that, that's pretty interesting. All right, so maybe I'm giving him too much credit or more likely it was just written that way and it couldn't be changed because that happens all the time in movies. You know, they're on schedules, budgets, whatever. There's a lot of reasons why stuff like that happens. 
But no matter the case, the positive or negative outcome and feedback of a film is always on the shoulders of the director, whether it was their doing or not. They take the credit or the fall, no matter what. Because at the end of the day, they're responsible for everything on screen. They either directly have the idea or tell someone what to do, or they approve someone else's idea. Either way, it's all their responsibility. And it's been marked up by Ridley himself. And in the early going, you can see the, the fine detail on which he offered feedback. Thanks, Ridley Scott. I love it. And so do all the fans. The last thing that Ridley Scott wants to do is piss off the people who essentially for the last 25 years like sort of idolized this movie. <sighs> you know, maybe we just can't trust Ridley Scott anymore. He's too damn old. He's like 90 years old and he's still making five films a year. He needs to slow down. As far as the other characters, one of the main ones is Elizabeth Shaw, played by Numi Rapace. I think she's great in the role and is more of a scientist version of an Ellen Ripley type character. I feel like her potential, if anything, was held back by the writing, but I like her character and she's acted about as well as that role can be done. But it's what I choose to believe. Get it out! Come on! Please! Oh, oh God! I think overall she's a fantastic actress and really, you know, does a good job in this role. And she had a great badass setup, actually, at the end of the film. May I ask what you hope to achieve by going there? They created us. Then they tried to kill us. They changed their minds. I deserve to know why. But was completely shafted in the sequel that shall not be named. <laughs> God, I hate what they did with it. One thing, though, about her character that I always thought was weird was after she performs the surgery on herself, which is a great scene, by the way, one of the highlights, actually, and she runs into David and Wayland in that room, and she's surprised to see Wayland, which makes sense. We're on the ship all this time. Why? She thought he was dead, but, you know, doesn't seem to be acknowledging the fact that David and two other people clearly had malicious intent towards her and literally wanted to keep her as a host to whatever alien parasite was inside her, which probably would have killed her. And, you know, she's not mad at all at David and later the other character, Ford, played by the very Scottish Kate Dickey. Only if you're breathing through an exhaust pipe, CO2 is over 3%. Two minutes without a suit, you're dead. Is also ignored. I don't get that. You know, she basically tried to make her lab specimen and, you know, was very aware of everything and Whatever, you know, that's just the way that this film is, I guess. Those confrontations actually were probably shot and cut in editing, like many other scenes that should have been in the film, which aren't. <laughs> Another standout disappointment is one of the other main characters, Charlie Holloway. I think Logan Marshall Green is one of those, yeah, I'm good looking, but I can act actors. Kind of like Brad Pitt in his early days. I guess he's still that way, but he's a lot more established. He's a good actor. He can be a little too Brad Pitty sometimes. But back to the Charlie Holloway actor, his role is limited here, but I've seen his work in other films and he's pretty capable. So if he's used right, he's good. Okay, all right, so what's the plan? What are we doing? Ah! 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 Stop him! Ah! 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 His character is obviously supposed to be arrogant, but he's also supposed to be a brilliant scientist, and yet he has no protocols with anything he does. and just acts like some dude who's just hyped to be on the ship. There. Hey, what are you doing? Dr. Holloway, why don't you take a seat? There's only six hours left of daylight. Why don't you leave it till the morning? Oh, no, 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 no. It's Christmas, Captain, and I want to open my presents. And speaking of that, nobody except Shaw and Holloway, ever appear to be excited or even intrigued by, you know, encountering other life or our creators, like... If there's anything in here worth looking at, these pops will find them. Son of a bitch. They were right. I don't care who you are, if you're on a ship traveling to another planet that potentially has not only life, other life, but our creators, you're gonna be either scared or excited. 
Some of the other characters become, you know, a little more interested, but not all that much. I get most of these people are just here to do a job, but come on. Stuff like this is just disappointing in light of the concept of meeting our maker, but back to Holloway. That character can be arrogant, but he's still a scientist. Like when he takes off his helmet in that great scene, if he would have done it later in that scene, you know, maybe had a little more to say, it would have come across better instead of just a dumb, quick decision. He also pouts instantly after they see the engineer bodies, like, Mortal laughter. What is that? He's literally acting just like some dude whose vibe was killed. He's a scientist. He should be analyzing shit like his girlfriend Shaw does with the DNA. He even gets excited by that when Shaw brings it up to him, that human DNA matches the engineers. Their genetic material predates ours. We come from them. No. <laughs> okay. Okay. So stuff like that is just character oversight that you can't really blame the actors because overall, again, it's the director's fault. He could notice that they're doing something if it wasn't his idea maybe and adjust it. That's what directing is. But, you know, that's what we get. It's a little disappointing. But again, maybe he had more scenes that were just cut, and instead he's just framed this way, which... Ugh, there's a lot of that in this movie. Michael Fassbender plays David, and is brilliant, and given the best role in the film, as he's literally the only one who's not an idiot. Makes sense, because he's not human, I guess, but he literally reminds the characters of how he's much smarter than them, and they're idiots throughout the film. There's like three scenes where he mocks them, and it seems like, oh, he's just making some mocking joke, but no, he's literally showing how retarded these characters are. <laughs> Provided it's correct, it's good. That's why they called it a thesis, Doctor. But anyway, w wait a second, does that mean David, why are you wearing a suit, it was intentional? Man? I beg your pardon. Could be, but that's the one part of the film that was executed poorly. I was designed like this because you people are more comfortable interacting with your own kind. If I didn't wear the suit, it would defeat the purpose. Well, besides Shaw, I guess they, later on in the film, they make a good pairing, actually. What's that? They team up at the end? Wow, you know, that that sequel must be lit then, because, you know, David's smart, and Shaw's like the only decent character in the film, and she kind of turns into a bat. I really want to see that, That that's awesome. <laughs> Never gonna see that. I don't want to go back to where we came from. I want to go where they came from. You think you can do that, David? David is really hard to read in the film, which was intentional. There is nothing in the desert, and no man needs nothing. What was that? Just something from a film I like. He's charming yet untrustworthy, and by the end of the film, evil in regards to human morals, but then again, he's not human. I didn't think you had it in you. Sorry. Poor choice of words. Extraordinary survival instincts. Like there's a scene with the Charlie Holloway character and David, where poor little Charlie's pouting in a corner, playing with balls, and uh, David comes in with the drink and a little drop of the black goo, because he wants to test what will happen if he ingests it. He has a good idea, but he wants to see what will happen. And in that scene, he basically gets permission from him to do that. How far would you go to get what you came all this way for? Your answers. What would you be willing to do? Anything and everything. That's worth drinking to, I'd imagine. He makes a scientific choice that wasn't moral, but he still yeah, does get that, permission, which could be something in his programming. And in that scene, maybe it's not evil because does he understand the concept of it? He's an android. He might know the definition, but he doesn't encode that kind of stuff like humans do, you know, emotions and such. So who knows, but he does get permission from him. So that means something. Then we have Charlize Theron who plays Meredith Vickers and 
That role spawned her intense whisper acting style, which if you've seen the Fast and Furious movies. They are adorable little things, aren't they? God, I hope I don't hurt him. You might know what I'm talking about. Probably some of her later roles. You know, it's kind of like the Johnny Depp thing where after he played Jack Sparrow, it's just, that's part of his personality now, whether he's acting or not. Where is the bloody rum? But her character isn't an idiot like the other characters. Well, until the end, when she forgets how to turn left. But her character does serve a purpose thematically, which shows how similar a human can be to something that doesn't experience emotions, like David. What did he say? Are you a robot? Idris Elba plays Janik, and he's as smooth as ever. He's, he's really an actor I wouldn't mind having some role in every movie ever made. He's just so smooth and cool. Don't you want to know what they have to say? I don't care. And his character does get to be a hero towards the end, so there's that. Impact imminent. Guy Pierce plays Peter Wayland, and again due to editing cuts, for some reason ends up only playing what appears to be a 150 year old man. I've heard from many that the makeup was bad, but I honestly think that just stems from the fact that it's a known, much younger actor playing the oldest looking man I've ever seen, and not so much the actual makeup, because I, I think the makeup's fine, but it's, it's, I think it's just that. But that being said, you know, he's perfectly fine in the role, acting wise. Anything else? No. One of the best parts of the film is the score, which... God, I love that score. It was composed by Mark Strattenfeld, and it really is beautiful, truly. It's amazing, and it's one of the best parts of the movie. It's indescribable. I really love the central theme, which is called life, and it's heard in the beginning of the film, and I think one or two other times, Definitely the part where David is spinning in the room full of planetary lights or whatever. It's a cool scene, actually. Really cool visual effect. And that score, that score makes it. The scariest thing about being human is the fear of the unknown. I mean, really think about it. Both in terms of what is in the actual universe and how we were created and what happens when we die. And dangling that in front of humans is both infinitely exciting and terrifying at the same time. It can drive you mad, really, if you think about it too long. And I mean really think about it with no answers. That's why it's honestly not good to dwell on, <laughs> because it's like the forbidden apple. It's so tempting at times to do so, but not much good can come from it, because will we ever know how we were created, what happens when we die? One of those answers you'll never know until you actually die. So, what's scarier than that? There's nothing. I know. Prometheus introduces us to that excitement and horror. We get a chance to meet our creator, who's portrayed in the film as basically a Greek god statue with perfect physicality who then not only wanted to destroy us, but failed to do so because their own weapon has turned against them. And if that weapon did that to our more advanced creators, what chance do we have? And what else is even out there? Who created our engineers? It's really unnerving to think about. And this is just a movie. What did he say? He asked to know why you're here. Does something like that actually exist in real life, in humankind? I don't know, it could, which is why it's scary to think about. Now what's so good about Prometheus is the question it flirts with. Where did we come from? How did we get here? What does it all mean? Prometheus suggests we were engineered by another life form, a superior life form, fittingly known as the engineers. <laughs> What did he say? What, what? what concept regarding humankind is higher than that? It's the ultimate question, and 
infinitely interesting because it's a question we might never know, or at least many generations will never know. The film has such a smart concept and is executed so well in terms of its presentation, yet treats its audience like troglodytes. Which, if you don't know what that is, it's a great word for basically cavemen. Look it up. Maybe most of us are, but maybe a movie like this is entitled to be better than its general audience. This kind of science fiction gives us hope in looking beyond the scope of our own lives. And to me, that's what makes filmmaking so amazing, is the fact that you can tell stories like this. That's why I really am inspired by Prometheus and love it. So when Prometheus introduces us to the, the great ragtag crew that we get to know later in the film, the great scientist team, there's a parallel with aliens, specifically when Fifield, great old Fifield, talks about being there to make money. I made him make money. Why does that sound familiar? Because Ridley Scott had the same theme with this film's sort of sequel, at least in terms of timeline, Alien. This was not my contract to do this kind of duty. And what about the money? If you want to give me some money to do, I'd be happy to. Hold, you know, just, all right, Let's go with the bonus. Many of the characters on that film had the same kind of mentality, that they're just here to do a job, that they're only motivated by money when it comes to this kind of stuff. Now, there's nothing wrong with that theme. The problem here is the fact that this isn't a blue-collar mining team. This is a crew that's supposed to be on an expedition to discover life, probably our curators, and it's crewed by experts in their fields whether they're scientists or not. And it just makes the characters appear stupid and the film dumbed down to even introduce stuff like that. Like, really? You're just here to make money. Oh, I'm here to make money. Good old Fifield. He's an expert in geology or whatever the fuck. And I'm only here to make money. I don't care about life. Bad, 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 bad. Prometheus really had the perfect setup for a sequel. Not a lot of info on the engineers was given to us. Like how, as stated in the film, that compound of the engineered black goo had an outbreak and that door was shut 2,000 or so years ago. How long has it been dead? 2,000 years, give or take. What happened? Where have the engineers been? If it's been 2,000 years and they tried to destroy us and never tried again, you know, that's interesting. Where are they? What have they been up to? Are they even still out there? Why do they even want to destroy us? And it was meant for us. Why? Sure, enough. For God's sake, shut her up. What's it? <laughs> I need to know why. What did we do wrong? Why do you hate us? You know, those are all great questions. Really interesting. Would have loved to see that. But no, instead we were treated to the horrendous alien covenant. Because of retarded, toxic fandom that didn't even like Prometheus to begin with. <laughs> Doesn't make sense to me. They were just complaining about it. What's the point of morphing a sequel from a film toxic fans didn't even like into a hybrid movie that ruins both films and franchises? Even though Prometheus is part of the Alien franchise, it still could have branched off on its own Sean David engineer ass kicking thing. I can confidently say that this film really could benefit from a director's cut. And he's done it before, even when it wasn't necessary on Alien. I don't know why he wouldn't do it for Prometheus. Come on Ridley Scott, please do it. I know I've seemingly trashed many aspects of the film, but make no mistake, I love this film. It's hard to not see the wasted potential of the phenomenal concept of the film and the presentation of it, but this film inspired me the first time I watched it, and it's still having that same effect to this day, even if it stings a little. Oh no, God! So, after having said all that in a very long, Prometheus Exploration, a film I dearly love and care about and wish was better, but never will be, and had a terrible sequel, and yada yada. There's only one thing left to say. Contain it, no! Contain it, turn it off now! I don't want the smell. Mortal after all.